Well, as we head into this matchup with Oregon State, the pressure is on the Ducks and the pressure is on Dan Lanning. And I think he's ready for it. Here we go. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked On Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day and your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks. So if you haven't already, like, comment, and subscribe, rate, review, please, and thank you wherever you listen to or watch this show, which today is brought to you by Prize Picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash Locked On College. Use code Locked On College for a first deposit match up to 100 Dollars Daily fantasy sports made easy. Lots to get to today on the show. Some Oregon State talk coming a bit later. We've got Heisman stuff to talk about. But I think big picture in this game, it's pretty clear. The pressure is all on Oregon here, given that Oregon State is coming into this game with a we have nothing to lose mentality. That is 100% where Oregon State is at in their season. They've lost three conference games. They can't get to the Pac-12 championship game. They are solely in the mindset of we want to win this game to continue to prove that we belong at the power five level or power four level, which they absolutely do. As we know, as most people should know, I would think I would hope. And also they want to play spoiler again. This is a program that hasn't won in Eugene since 2007. I think Jonathan Smith is going to pull out all the stops here and Lanning and the ducks. That's the side that's looking to get to the PAC 12 championship game. It's win and get in. We cannot rely on Arizona State to beat Arizona. I don't see that happening. I think the Wildcats are playing too good of football right now, and the Sun Devils, as we learn, are too shorthanded. So it's either beat Oregon State or fall short of every goal that Oregon had, at least in my view, before the season. Yeah, they've reached 10 wins. That's fantastic. They're in a really great spot. But before the year, I said a goal for measuring a successful season is you got to get to the Pac-12 championship game. And here you are. Last week of the regular season, play in Oregon State, win and you're in. Don't need anybody else to do anything. Oregon controls its own fate there. And in all likelihood, Oregon controls its own fate to get to the college football playoff as well. That's not a guarantee, but it's more likely than not right now as the Ducks are on the outside looking in behind all the undefeateds. But, you know, things can obviously change in in the last few weeks. But here's the other thing, you know, that, that's why the pressure's on Oregon. And, and by the way, just for people who don't know, the reason Oregon has to win here or have Arizona State win to play in uh, Las Vegas, where I will be next week, by the way, no matter what, hopefully Oregon is going to be there. The tiebreaker with Arizona, according to the Pac-12 bylaws, goes like this, and it actually makes a lot of sense. It is the best, it's the record against the highest seeded conference or common conference opponent. So if if Oregon were to lose or anything like that, so who's the highest common seeded highest seeded common opponent that they've played? It's Arizona or it's Washington. Both teams lost to Washington. So then you'd keep going down the list and if Oregon State were to have won in this hypothetical, the next common opponent is Oregon State. And they would be decisively the number four seed in the Pac-12, Arizona beat him. We would have lost to him. That's why Arizona would get in. But because the Wildcats have got two Pac-12 losses to USC and Washington, and Oregon just has the one, if the Ducks win, they're in. So that's pressure component number one. Here's the second thing, though, for Dan Lanning. He's got a lot of feathers in his cap as head coach. I mean, a lot of them. The recruiting's been great. There have been a lot of wins. The team has looked very good. The team has improved both week to week throughout the course of this season, year to year from a season ago. I think this Oregon team beats last year's Oregon team. Absolutely. Because this year's defense is significantly improved. I even think the offense is a touch sharper than it was last year. But Dan Lanning, one thing he doesn't have yet is a win against a rival. He's 0-3 against Washington and Oregon State. And no, if, if if the Ducks lose this game, which I don't think is going to happen, just to be clear, it could, but I don't think it's going to happen. I think the Ducks will be all right. We'll talk about that more a little bit later as uh, the week goes on. But 
if Oregon were to lose this game, he'd be 0-4 against the rivals, and that just doesn't sit well with the Ducks. And I think if you're Dan Lanning, whether he'd admit it or not, you don't want to have that cloud continuing to hang over your head as Oregon's head coach. There wouldn't be hot seat talk or anything ridiculous like that if Oregon loses on, on Friday to the Bees. It would, however, be just another thing that he's just got to get over once again. But here's the good news. And this is a game that, you know, Oregon's at home. They're a big favorite. Oregon State's season is, you know, done from the standpoint of achieving their, their, their goals before the year. But the good news and why I feel like Dan Lanning is ready for that sort of stage and okay with that is his mannerisms that we see on these cinematic recaps, you know, in post-game pressers, talking after practice and whatnot. This is a guy who's wanted to be a head coach for a while. He's making the most of his opportunity. And what I've talked about the last few weeks on the show gives me a lot of confidence. And that's that he has Oregon ready to play every week. All right. Aside from the Georgia game, which was really just an unfair first game, right? Let's throw that one out because there's no world in which Oregon was going to be able to win that football game. It is first ever game as a head coach. There has not been a single game in which Oregon has been unprepared to play. That's reflective of two things. Number one, he knows what he's doing schematically on both sides of the ball with his coaching staff to identify things that are going to work and emphasize certain traits and de-emphasize other ones because of the opponent or whatever the case may be. And I think we've seen this as well in a number of occasions. He knows how to motivate his football team and keep them focused. Like this is a game where you, you can't put that there, there's no, I, I think Oregon state fans, at least the ones I know are expecting to lose this game. And Oregon fans are expecting to win this game that by default puts the pressure on Oregon there. But I don't, I think that's more an issue for us than it is for them. Them being the ducks inside the locker room. When Lanning's talking to him, getting them motivated. They're the same team when they come out week in week out, they're doing a great job of not playing down to an opponent's level, but playing to a standard. And that's reflective of the culture that the head coach is setting and the way that he is able to motivate and prepare his football team. And that's why I think he's more than ready for this spot. That's why, yes, I just hit my hand on the table while I was trying to make a point of emphasis, if you heard that. So I think that they're going to be ready to play. I feel really confident about Dan Lanning. Every single week, you know, 42 to nothing in a half. I don't care if it's a bad power five team. Arizona State comes out and plays their butts off every week, and Oregon just came out and trounced them. Okay, that, that, that that's some Chip Kelly 2010 stuff, 42 to nothing at the half. That, that That's really, really good coaching. That is assembling a roster with a lot of talent, knowing what everyone does well, putting them in positions to succeed, executing on game day with the proper level of motivation, drive, and focus. These are the things that make me think Lanning's a really good head coach. Yeah, this is a big game for him. He's got to win it for a number of reasons. You got to be able to beat your rival at some point, and you got to win to keep your Pac-12 and college football playoff hopes alive. Yeah, it's just the second year as a head coach, but I think it's a big one for Lanning. The Ducks are about a two-touchdown favorite right now, which is a lot of points, but reflective of what this Oregon team is capable of. If the Ducks play their best brand of football, even if Oregon State plays well, we might not be sweating by the end of that fourth quarter. I don't know if I'm going that far. I do definitely think Oregon uh, is going to win the game. I don't know if Bo Nix is going to win the Heisman, but boy, he's going to have a really, really good opportunity to do so. You've got a great opportunity over at Prize Picks, which is the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America. The easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports is just you against the numbers. Instead of battling thousands of other players, including pros and sharks, you pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections, and you'll watch the winnings roll in. Prize Picks even has this really neat thing, this great feature known as a reboot policy, so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. So when you're playing fantasy football and your guy goes down midway through the first quarter and he's not going to return to the game, you get zero points if he hasn't put up any to that point. But that's not the case over at Prize Picks. One of the great 
things they've got over there and one of many reasons why you should go check them out. Go test your skills with prize picks at prizepicks.com slash locked on college. Use code locked on college for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars. That's prizepicks.com slash locked on college. Use code locked on college for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars. Prize picks daily fantasy sports made easy. When recovering from sickness, second segment sips have never felt so valuable. An essential part of every good show. Thank you so much for tuning in, by the way. If you want to become a Locked On Ducks insider, you get priority mailbag access. You can talk with me one-on-one. You get breaking news, reactions, insights, and a lot of things that people who just listen to or watch the show, who I greatly, greatly appreciate no matter who you are or however you consume the show. You get all sorts of extra stuff. Free 14-day trial, then it's just $5 a month. Absolutely, positively not a requirement, but plenty of perks if you go over there. But that's a great way to get into the mailbag. So too, our YouTube comments are Twitter at Smalls underscore 55 or at Locked on Ducks. This one from Duck the Rules. Hey, Spence, what do you think about the Jaden Daniels Heisman hype? And in comparison to Bo Nix, where Jaden Daniels stats are off the charts and QBR on pace to be the highest ever in FBS. Also just wanted to say, because of you, I've discovered the song Benny and the Jets. Never really gave Elton John a chance before. Okay. Of all the things that I have accomplished on this show, which I am immensely proud of and grateful to all of you for, none of them can be as singularly important as getting one of you into the magical world of enjoying Elton John. Okay? Nothing can ever compare. If I, I, I hope, I hope that you have heard Tiny Dancer as well, because if you haven't, that's your next listen right there. Locked on Ducks is your first listen. Tiny Dancer by Old John, that's your second listen. So anyway, get back to the question here. The Jaden Daniels Heisman hype is reminiscent of two guys, 2022's Caleb Williams and 2016's Lamar Jackson. So those guys were on college football teams that were good, but they weren't in the national championship picture when the four-team playoff was uh, announced, you know, the final four teams. So Jaden Daniels isn't going to be there. He's not even going to play in the SEC championship game. The commonality among all those three is their numbers are gaudy. I I mean, they are, that's G-A-W-D-Y, I believe. Bud will double check that for me. But I think that his numbers are wildly impressive. And he completely, 100% deserves the Heisman hype. Because the Heisman trophy is supposed to be given This is the weird dichotomy. It's supposed to be given to the best player in college football. It isn't always. Sometimes it is. Oftentimes it is. It is not always. Okay. Christian McCaffrey didn't win the Heisman in 2015. I'm still mad about it. I'm I'm still, that is the, that is the dumb. That's when I stopped like paying attention to the Heisman race as much throughout the year, unless an Oregon player was involved, because that was just the most ridiculous thing I have ever seen. It's absolutely patently absurd. But Jaden Daniels' numbers this year are also absurd. He has thrown for over 3,000 yards, which is well over 300 a game. He is also someone who has run for over 1,000 yards. He is Bo Nix and Bucky Irving put together statistically. I don't think he has as many touchdowns as Bucky. I didn't double check. But Bucky's a 1,000-yard rusher right now, and Bo is over 3,000 passing yards with 35 touchdowns and two picks. Jaden Daniels, to have well over 4,000 yards of total offense, is reminiscent of Caleb Williams last year, who I believe, he didn't hit 1,000 rushing yards, but he was over, I think he was around 44, 4,500 total yards, and he had like 44 touchdowns or something like that. So when your numbers are so spectacular, you can overcome the barrier that is a lack of team success in the national championship picture. So I think it's completely legitimate. And Jaden Daniels, no matter what, should be a Heisman finalist. Should he win it? That depends on your perspective. Completely depends on your perspective. If you are looking at what the award is supposed to be, which is give the award to the best individual player in college football, that answer is Jaden Daniels. That, 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 that is completely and utterly true. Bo Nix is completely vital to Oregon's success. I am not disparaging that in any way. Comparatively, the idea of with one game to go in the regular season, 
being a thousand yard rusher as a quarterback who's also over 3,000 yards passing. So it's not like he's in a triple option quarterback run offense. He's just that valuable for them. He is their entire offense. Bo Nix runs the offense at a ridiculously high level. Jaden Daniels is the offense for LSU. So in the traditional sense, it should be given to Jaden Daniels. Now, in the actual sense of how the award has been facilitated, the answer is Bo Nix if Oregon wins their next two games. Because the way the award has been handed out before is it's given to the best player on one of the best teams that has a chance to win a national championship. And so last year, you know, the college football playoff, you had CJ Stroud. His numbers weren't good enough. Stetson Bennett was great. He was a finalist, but his numbers were not as good as Caleb Williams. And everyone knew Williams was the best player in college football. He just didn't have the team uh, to, to match it because they couldn't beat Utah last year. And this year, well, they couldn't beat that many people, period. So last year you had Georgia, Stetson Bennett, you had a Caleb Williams, and I forget who the other Heisman finalist was, but um. You know, when you look at the best teams this year, like the only answers for the Heisman Trophy conversation right now are Jaden Daniels, Bo Nix, and Michael Penix. And yeah, there are going to be some people that put Marvin Harrison in there. Troy Franklin has more receiving yards than him this season. So uh, I'm, I, I think Marvin Harrison is awesome, by the way. Fantastic. Not a Heisman Trophy guy. Not, not if Troy Franklin is sitting over here out receiving him by a couple hundred yards on the year. And yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not on board with, with, with that. And there was w once upon a time, I'd like to take a small victory lap here. There were people saying JJ McCarthy for Heisman. I said, what are you talking about? He's, he's in Michigan's off. No. Yeah. And then he didn't throw a pass in the second half against Penn state. Suddenly that's quieted down just a little bit there. That's a team, not a quarterback led team. Uh, over over at Michigan. So I think it's pretty legit, which is a transition into the next question here from, from Peyton, which is what's the argument for Bo winning the Heisman over Jane Daniels? Oregon getting into the playoff. If the Ducks don't get into the playoff, Bo will not win the Heisman. There, there is absolutely positively no way. If Oregon gets into the playoff, if Oregon wins this week, there is a very real case that the Pac-12 championship game the winner will get the Heisman Trophy between Bo Nix and Michael Penix. That's 100% possible. Here's what I suspect. Are you ready? I know this is I know this is a hot take in college football, but I think that the Heisman Trophy, like many things, is, is influenced unjustly by SEC bias. I know, I know. First, we're all hearing of that particular term. And Penix's odds have plummeted compared to what they were. He was the betting favorite once upon a time. But last week against Oregon State in a downpour, he doesn't put up impressive numbers. There's like 150 some odd yards and two touchdowns or something like that because it turns out you can't throw when you can't grip the football. Surprise, surprise. Jaden Daniels puts up seven, eight, or like 27 touchdowns against Georgia State, and we're all oodling over the numbers. Oh, my gosh, look at this guy. Like, Bo Nix had six touchdowns and a half that's – against better competition. I, I, I don't know what we're doing here. So I think it is a real possibility that Daniels wins. I think that here's the other thing. Because Bo Nix played at Auburn and Oregon is a bigger brand than Washington and the betting market reflects all of those things, by the way. I think that if Oregon wins their next two games, there's a better chance of Bo Nix winning the Heisman than if Penix wins his next two games and Washington goes into the playoff undefeated. Should Penix be the Heisman Trophy winner at that point? Yes. Based on how the award has been adjudicated in the last half decade or so. Will it be Jaden Daniels? Yeah, absolutely could be. He could pull a Caleb Williams here. His numbers are that good. But the argument for Bo getting in over Jaden Daniels is that the narrative is that he's got his team in a position to win a national championship and Jaden Daniels does not. And team success has always been tied to that award, whether or not you think it should be. It has always played a factor, always has, always will. So if Oregon is in a significantly better spot, I think the Ducks quarterback have a pretty good chance of outlasting Jaden Daniels for the Heisman. 
I don't think it's a guarantee, though. And I'd rather win a national championship, of course, than Bo get the Heisman. I'd love to have both. You know, in a world where you can have both, have both. So that would be fantastic. Oregon State is up on Friday night in Eugene. I won't be there. But again, if the Ducks are able to win, like many of us think they will, I will be at the game in Vegas next Friday. I say that because a number of you ask all the time, hey, are you going to any Oregon games this year? Are you going to any? Well, if the Ducks do what they're supposed to do this week, I'll be there next week. You can't take the bees lightly, though. You can't take the bees lightly, and I'll tell you why. I'll also tell you why LinkedIn Jobs is great, because these days, every new potential hire can feel like a high-stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. So go in there and create a free job post in minutes, which is super easy. And then you add the purple hashtag hiring frame to your profile to spread the word that you're hiring also easy. And small businesses, because of this and many other things like screening tools, use or rate LinkedIn jobs rather number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All righty. So Oregon State is eight and three. Uh, I'm recording this just before the college football playoff rankings come out. I imagine they'll be somewhere around 15. If Oregon beats them, they'll probably fall a little bit further. They should stay inside the top 20. They're a good football team. Jonathan Smith is a really good coach. They've got a great offensive line. But Oregon being a big favorite, look, maybe it's just the little kid duck fan in me that has seen, you know, so many letdowns as recently as, you know, last year. Uh, against Washington, by the way, the Ducks were a 12 and a half point favorite, lost the game outright. So I I look at this matchup and say, okay, Oregon's a better team. Completely agree. Not, not, not trying to argue with the other, not trying to downplay the Ducks. I just don't want that line to overestimate the beefs. If Oregon goes out and wins this game by 20 points, that's a testament to how good Oregon is. Not that Oregon State, oh, wasn't as good as we thought. No, Oregon State is really good. Oregon State has lost three games this year. Here are their losses by three points, three points, and two points, and two of those games were on the road to teams who were ranked at the time the Beavers played them. Arizona actually was not, beg your pardon, though they soon would be. They played Washington State before the Cougs hit their slide, and they lost to Arizona when Arizona was about to be ranked, and then they lost to Washington last week by two points. Okay. That's the first thing. So this is not a team that has, you know, been blown out this year. They have played everybody on their schedule close or one big. Second thing, we know that Jonathan Smith is a great coach. What he's done with that program has been really good. He's going to be an attractive candidate for head coaching jobs this off season, 100% because he's a really good coach. I hope he stays at Oregon state because he likes that program and he's a great fit there and is doing a really good job. I don't know if he will, like, we'll, we'll, we'll just kind of have to see. But the early reports have been he's on board with what Oregon State's plan is for 2024. We'll see if that ends up being the case. Third reason, you can't overlook the beefs. Remember the Oregon State team that the Ducks lost to last year. The quarterback was, drumroll please, Ben Branson. That guy completed six passes, threw two interceptions, and somehow the Ducks found a way to embarrassingly lose that game. Another reason, Lennon needs to win this one to just put that one completely out of memory. A statement win would be fantastic as well when you're in the midst of a college football playoff chase. Oregon State has a better quarterback than last year. He is not a top-shelf quarterback. DJ Uyunglele can make really good throws. Big guy, fairly mobile, big arm, can make some really special throws. He has also completed under 60% of his passes in seven games this year. Oregon State is four and three in those contests. Oregon is the best passing defense in the Pac-12, allowing about 213 yards a game. So that's another reason you have to look at Oregon State and say, yep, cannot be overlooking the beefs here. Do not, I, I just refuse to stare at the point spread and say, oh, well, Vegas thinks we're going to be fine. So clearly we'll be fine. Now, Oregon State 
is a dangerous team because they have that we got nothing to lose mentality. We want to play spoiler for our crosstown rival. Beat them twice in a row for the first time since 2007 or 2006 and 7. 2007, by the way, is the last time Oregon State walked away from Watson Stadium with a win. All that is on the line. Their defense has taken a step back from a year ago. It's still good. It's not quite as good as last year. You know, Cam Ward threw for over 400 yards. Went for over 400 yards on Oregon secondary, though, at Autzen. So, Cam Ward threw for a lot of yards. Cal put up a lot of points. I think Oregon's offense is going to be all right in this game. But it's still a good Oregon State defense that forces turnovers. And by the way, is sneaky good getting after the quarterback. Andrew Chatfield Jr., the Florida transfer, has got nine sacks this year. They've got 36 as a team. That's a good rate. They have they did not do a good job of pressuring Michael Penix last week. What do you know? They lost the game. That's the entire key to stopping Washington. Can you pressure Penix and get him off his spots? If Oregon State can't pressure Bo Nix in this game, Oregon is going to put up at least 35, if not 40 or more points. However, Oregon State has had their moments. So I think this is a good team and one that is not to be overlooked. That said, as I talked about earlier in the show, I feel really confident in the Ducks here, but I am not feeling, you know, Arizona State levels of confidence. I am not feeling Colorado levels of confidence. I don't think the game is going to be like that. I think it looks a lot more like the Washington State game where, you know, the Beavs maybe even throw an early punch and the Ducks are down. But if Oregon gets rolling, I don't think there's anything Oregon State can do to stop them because I like this Oregon team on both sides of the ball. So that's kind of an early look at Oregon State. Let me know what you want to hear or what you want to know about the Beavs. I've covered them a lot over on Lockdown Pack 12 this year. So drop your questions in the YouTube comments below or hit me up on Twitter at Smalls underscore 55 or at Locked on Ducks. If you want priority mailbag access, once again, you can become a Locked on Ducks insider. If you go to join subtext.com slash locked on ducks, link in the description below wherever you listen to or watch this show. Quick shout out, by the way, Oregon men's basketball, super shorthanded. Now they're playing a bad team in Florida AM, right? Completely understand that. They have a test against my alma mater, Santa Clara, over in Florida on Friday. That's going to be uh, Santa Clara is a solid mid major team. Oregon men's, men's basketball is 4 0. Nate Biddle did not play on Monday against the uh, the Rattlers. And Folly Dante did not play. We don't know what their, the status of their injuries are. Jackson Shellstad and Mookie Cook, the five-star freshman, have not taken the court so far this season. The early impressions I get from this Oregon team, and I talk about this with uh, subtext people quite a bit, so if you want more Oregon basketball coverage, that's a great, great place to go. I look at this team, and I see a ton, a ton of guard depth and vastly improved shooting so far. Oregon being able to hit threes is a nice change of pace from last year when they really struggled, had a historically bad year shooting the three. Jadrian Tracy, junior college guy. Dana Altman loves him, some junior college guys. He's a good player. He can score inside and out. He is a really good shooter. That's what he was billed as when he came over. I think he was 43% from beyond the arc uh, at the JUCO level a season ago. But when you look at Jesse Zarzuela, the Central Michigan transfer, Jadrian Tracy, Brennan Rigsby, who's back from last year's team, again, another former Juco guy, you got Kuznard and Bartholomew back. It's a deep lineup of guards. And again, Shellstad isn't even there yet. He's not in the mix. So I, I like what I'm seeing so far. I don't think they're playing their best basketball. They didn't play their best basketball against Florida A&M. They, they did However, get the win and avoid things we've seen pretty often from Oregon in the last couple of years, which is a, a loss early in the season where you go, oh, that's just, that's going to make the at-large resume tougher. They've avoided that to this point. So if they can continue doing that, it'll be a good early stretch until they get other guys back. I'm excited to see Shellstad and Mookie Cook, who will reportedly be back within the next few weeks. The Ducks are going to need and Folly Dante Nate Biddle, though. No question about it. And guess what? No question. I'll be here tomorrow as well. Appreciate everyone listening. I'll see you next time. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And as always, go Ducks.